In life's journey, we must seek to reflect, learn, and grow. Welcome to the Road to Rediscovery with your host, Aubrey Johnson. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Road to Rediscovery. I'm your host, Aubrey Johnson, and I am so excited that you're here with me. The Road to Rediscovery is about reflecting on life lessons to learn and grow from them and to take it to the next level, reach out and help others who are struggling through dark times. My special guest is a professional actor and voice artist. Using his tremendous talents of storytelling and innovation, he helps others realign with their true story as well as rediscover their energy. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Paul Socket. Hey, Paul, how are you, man? Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's, quite, it's been a while since I've heard a, an audience clap. <laughs> <laughs> well, just so many people are glad that you're here, man, and ready to share whatever insights you can share, man. So let's go ahead and just get started here. Can you share with the listeners just, you know, where you're from and, and what was life for Paul growing up? Well, I'm from the UK. I'm from uh, the north of England, near Manchester. Uh, I'm currently on this call in South Portugal. Um, and my life growing up was a working class background, um, two kids, both parents present, uh, present during my upbringing. Mm-hmm. Um, I was very large as a child i'm six foot four now but i was you know two feet long when i was born so um, i knew a very different uh sort of junior school i think americans call it you know primary school for for us um than a lot of other children because i was larger than everybody else Mm. and there is something about all of the differences Mm-hmm. That in that in that microcosm of society, where my my school was only a hundred students right. across the whole school from five to eleven. Oh, and small school. Yeah, really yeah. small school. Yeah. So everyone knows everybody mm-hmm. in and out of school, and the experience in school is very different um, to outside of school uh, because it just the hierarchy is implanted at a very early age. Mm-hmm. And so you're just trying to find where you fit in. And if every part of you stands out, being the tallest, the largest, Mm -hmm. uh, the one with red hair, Mm -hmm. um, big feet, glasses, Mm -hmm. all of those things just get pointed out um, because everyone is seeking safety in um, knowing where they fit. No, for sure. So it was a tough time. It was a a tough (laughs) old um kind of foundation to life that i experienced and uh and it's and it's only now that certain parts of that conditioning and part of that shaping um is really that i'm really giving space to that to explore my relationship with my body mm-hmm. um with the space that i take up just physically yeah and um, not even creatively yeah um and uh and and I had two very supportive parents. Um, my dad was a very typical Northern man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the emotions weren't a thing that you really felt. <laughs> yes, yes. Or at least expressed. Yes. Yep. Um, uh, a mum who worked in the kitchen of my local primary school mm-hmm. and, uh, and was um, kind of part-time there and a, and a housewife the rest of the time. Mm-hmm. And I had an older sister um who's a lot more introverted than i am Mm -hmm. and so i so i found my space in that relationship um as being the the energy ball (laughs) right (laughs) um and was automatic not automatically what's the word i want to use i was naturally emotional oh okay um that all of my emotions were strong Mm -hmm. and I don't know, because I now I resonate with the word empath, this idea that I can sense other people's feelings and I feel that inside my own body. And so I don't know if I was absorbing that from the family dynamic, from uh, a rather emotionally stifled dad um, and uh, 
a mum who even now when we have conversations that she's still exploring um, how to show up in um, as herself fully, yes. um, which is everyone's story, I think, because yeah. we're told that we have to tell a story that is easier for someone else to digest. Gotcha. Um, and, you know, I think I, I overpowered energetically my sister. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was, well, it came from having hyperactivity and that not really being um, clocked straight away. So, you know, E-numbers in, in uh, fizzy drinks and sweets and things like that would, five minutes later, I'd be bouncing Wired. off the walls. And, yeah, I'd be all over the place. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, yeah, and, and I don't, th- I, I wasn't one of those people because I'm an actor now, a mm-hmm. performer, and I've been doing it for 16 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wasn't... I was, I was an introverted extrovert. Uh, it allowed me, I found a way of hiding. Yes. When all of my differences were pointed out at school, it's, it's, you know, it's a story that has been told many times. The idea of you find humor and you find deflection and you find quick wittedness yes. in order to deflect people's attentions. And, age old happens. Right, age is old. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Um, and so that I, and I think I learned that there in those formative years of going, you have to protect yourself at all costs. So you need to be in control of where you are, when you are and how you are. I see. Now, was that a result of, uh, just, you know, children can be cruel (laughs) at times Mm -hmm. and, and, and growing up in that space, uh, you know, uh, when you were in your own home, you didn't notice that you were different, but when you started going to primary school, you know, there's all these differences and the children calls it out. So when they call it out and you're trying to find the place where you fit in is, uh, was, was that that bring on the manifestation of what you, what you just mentioned, you know, you, you need to be very alert on where you are, what you're doing, what your purpose is at that time. Yes, I think so. Okay. And I think that also within the family environment as we are, we are conditioned by our lived experience and that is very much told by the family relationship and the local community and friends and school experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and having been brought up in a community that had a, an energy, it had this fizzing energy of we do not share our emotions. Right. It's just, it's the North of England is, I mean, it's a very British, this stiff upper lip energy, yes. but in yes. the North of England specifically, it's kind of this, the, the worker ethic and the mm-hmm. um, hardened <laughs> presence. It just, you can feel it, that everyone's kind of holding back. Right, right. And as an empath, I sort of went, oh, okay, that's how we exist then, is it? Oh, right, okay. So, <laughs> and then on top of people pointing out to me that I was different in all of these ways and right. all of them basically being a bad thing, even though they were things I couldn't control. Right, right. I, I chose to take everything I could control at school, in my family, um, uh, events, you know, all these things. Okay. And to control every part that I could control. Gotcha. And to mask the bits I couldn't. Mm, I see. I see. So um, the uh, there's a lot of history and um, and and generations before you that that kind of you know uh, builds the trend uh, and the custom, if you will, uh, or or culture of being uh, the stiff upper, stiff upper lip and um, the stiff upper lip. I can never say that word, stiff <laughs> upper lip. <laughs> to have that stiff upper lip and, uh, you know, no emotion, everything's okay. You work hard, you know, heads down, um, feet to the grindstone and all that sort of thing, you know, and, um, and, and I, can, I can sort of relate to that uh, because, uh, you know, we seem to be of the same age range. My parents, very old school. They were both in the military. And so my father, same way, no emotion. Um, you know, you, 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 you rule. Okay. You, you are always in charge. Uh, he's always in charge. What he said goes and uh, you know, you just 
worked very hard, didn't show any emotion. If anything hurt, you didn't hurt. Boys weren't supposed to cry and all this sort of thing, right? And, and that's generational, especially in African, African-American men growing up, you know? And so um, uh, that, that's, you know, a lot of, lot of my peers growing up can uh, relate to that with their parents as well. So uh, let's, Paul, let's talk about storytelling. Okay, and, and, and what I want to do first, if we can, is can you share with the listeners when or how early back do you remember being fascinated with stories or storytelling? Hmm. It's funny, I, someone asked the question in an online community that I'm part of, you know, what mm-hmm. was the first book you remember reading? Mm-hmm. And to me, it was, it was a book called uh, I Am a Book, <laughs> and, they <were> very, <laughs> and they were very short yeah um poems Mm -hmm. um you know i'm a book and like to be read i have 44 pages my cover is red you know and 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 it was almost just that Mm -hmm. and then the next one would be another poem and that in itself it is a story Mm -hmm. but it's also an invitation i've I've only just recently been able to put that connection to it is that i see i i love rhyme and i love rhythm and -hmm. i think that stemmed from being exposed to that book when i was a kid yes um and also rhythm is energy. So, and, and I think being empathic, being someone who is practicing keying into the balance between, uh, not even balance, the integration of masculine and feminine and um, space and being an actor and honing that skill of being aware of where everybody else is and balancing mm-hmm. the space. And mm-hmm. um, the thing about those really short poems was it was actually a really open invitation to, for imagination. Yes. Because I'm a book and like to be read. I have 44 pages, my cover is read. It doesn't tell me what that book is. Right. It doesn't tell me who owns the book. You know, yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's almost like the book speaking to me of like, I am a book. <laughs> <laughs> so it just, it invites the, the mind to explore. And to almost relax and go, oh, so I don't need to know everything for this to be fun. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, it doesn't have to tell me all the information. So I get to an end point and go, oh, I know everything about that. Now I can move on. Right. Just, it goes, here's a little thing next. And you're like, oh, yeah. okay, cool. <laughs> so you, can, <laughs> you, can flow, you can follow the intuitive energy of it. Yes. Um, and that's what I love about story. Mm. And improvisation yes and i use and i use that term and it's it feels laced with something else now because you know improv is very especially in america is a very there's a you know everyone, come on give me a name give me a place yeah. give me, and we'll create <laughs> right. this thing and it's all a little bit cheesy yeah um, yeah i love making things up and i love responding to what people give me yes. but i hate it when it's forced yeah, yeah. You, you want it to develop, you know, very much organically, right? If, it, if it's forced, then, you know, from uh, whether, whether you have an audience or not, but from an outsider's perspective, you know, it's not really convincing, I guess. Right. Well, yeah, it, it means I'm trying to take you somewhere. Yeah. And I'm controlling where we go. Mm-hmm. So, that's, so you close the invitation for imagination off. Very true. Very if true. I receive what you have and I use that just for us to go together yes. on a journey, mm-hmm. that's very different. Walking side by side with someone is very different to me holding the flag like a tour guide and going, we're going in this direction. You can right. come with me or you can not. <laughs> right, right. So that organic element, again, takes practice. but they, and, and with it comes a trust. Yes. And we don't get to flex that trust muscle very often. No, that's so true. And, you know, that makes it an art form. It, it's completely an art form, right? And uh, I'm a fan of improv. Um, I, I'm i not part of any comedic circuit or anything like that, but, um, but I, I've been a musician. And so one of my favorite genres is jazz music. And there's a lot of improvisation in jazz music. And you were just mentioning something a minute ago, Paul, um, regarding you love the energy when you do something and the response that you get, 
And that energy from the response drives your energy to, you know, to, 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 to respond to the response. Right. right. So, uh, so, so th there's that element It's called, uh, I think it's called call and respond or call and respond um, where, you know, uh, that level of trust to your point, you know, um, has to really be in place. And you're right. We don't, we don't express it or get the opportunity to stretch that enough, do we? Mm, no, we do not. Well, it's, it's conditioned out of us. Yeah. You know, we, the, the educational system that we're placed within teaches mm -hmm. us that we, you know, the bell goes and this is what you do when the bell goes. Right. And there are a series of bells throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And for legal reasons, you get 10 minutes a day because teachers have to take a break legally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And you, and so you learn the start of the day, the middle of the day and the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And then whatever out of that, all you have to do is be back where you started the next day. Mm. So yeah. we don't get the chance to trust our intuition. It's too structured. Right. It's, it's heavily structured. Yeah. yeah. Like the, I, the reason I said that, sorry, the reason I should clarify, <laughs> words are really important to me. And I, and I try to avoid using the word over something or to okay. something Makes only, sense. Be, only because that means that there, there is a measurement that we fit within. So to be, o to, to be overwhelmed mm -hmm. releases any agency that we have for example, okay. it's a very out to in energy. It means that we require something else outside of us to bring us back to ourselves. Mm, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, I just wanted to. <laughs> no, no. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, structure. Um, structure. Yeah. That we're still being shaped into factory workers. Mm-hmm. And we're still being shaped into convenience and we're being shaped into i'm so sorry that's a loud noise outside <laughs> no don't worry about that no it's all good man. um we're, we're being shaped into followers yes and by being shaped into followers automatically places us within a hierarchy mm -hmm. that we are respond that we are responsible for providing for the greater whole i see okay i got you that we are rely that we are dependent upon mm -hmm. a greater control in this case the, the the teacher in the class and the head teacher in the school right for our well-being mm, yeah because if they just let us roam free mm -hmm. then apparently all hell would break loose. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think that's true because as human beings, we are, we are inherently curious. Yeah, is that a proven curious. theory? Right, right. Well, this is, yeah. I mean, is, is it Finland or Iceland? One of the two. And they have the highest educational kind of results in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they only go to school, I think, three hours of the day. Wow, really? Yeah, and the rest of it is kind of is outdoor play, it's exploration, it's... Yeah. it's going through the forests and doing more like nature trail-y things and just picking yeah. up what you find along the way. Right, right. And they are top of the educational uh, ladder. Again, hierarchy. Who's yeah. best? Right. Who do we need to defeat? Um, it's, it's terrifying because it's everywhere. And, the, and the, the more I think about it, I spot it everywhere in the, in the, smallest, um, in the smallest sort of microcosm of an independent bookstore or to a relationship between um, two people romantically gotcha. right, to right. the largest corporation. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. We are all just trying to avoid being bottom. Mm -hmm. We're told to reach for the dream, but really it's a dream. So your chances are you're not going to get there. So, so we are conditioned to believe that like, oh, okay, so dreams are, dreams are great, and we should reach for them, but not really expect them. So in terms of feeling safe, being middle is best. Because I the see. idea of comparison and hierarchy and, and uh, status and um, ranking yeah. means that as long as we avoid being bottom, mm -hmm. we're safe. So we strive for average. We strive for the middle. 
So mediocrity is where people are wanting to drive towards because it's safe, because yeah. it's not at the bottom, like a bottom feeder or a factory worker. And I guess uh, some people may not think that they have that much potential to reach the upper echelon, as society puts it, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but we're told only a few people get there. Yeah, yeah. And it either takes a genius mm -hmm. or it takes someone who has um, a trust fund. <laughs> right, right. To even stand a chance. And Amazing. so it's, it's, we have been, <laughs> it's so insidious because what we've been told is you need to not be bottom. You need to strive for the top, but you can't have it. Yeah, that, that's pretty what hypocritical. Mean, you know, right. I'm, not quite, yeah. I'm not quite sure why, you know, we're told one thing, but from what we're seeing, you know, it's like, it's that glass ceiling, right? The proverbial glass ceiling. I mean, we see it up there and the object is right in within our reach. But as soon as we try to touch it, boom, our hand bumps up against that glass ceiling. It's actually on the other side of the glass, right? Right, right. Well, and, oh, and it's, it's all sales. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm getting into it <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that if there are certain parts of our existence yes. like dreaming mm -hmm. that we only do when we're asleep if we yes. think about it and dreams are really odd <laughs> dreams are random we we don't know how connections happen like suddenly we're in a building then suddenly we're on an island right and, right and the connection between those two is unfathomable mm. And so if we're using that word, and this is where we get into words being really important, yes. is that if we use the word dream, oh, my dream is to get somewhere, achieve right. something, have as right. you know, some amount of money, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there gets to a point where we haven't been able to make those connections of how that's actually possible. I see. Because it's a dream. It's yeah. something that is so outside of ourselves. Yeah. That because it's outside of ourselves, the energy required for that is that we need someone to provide something for this magical gap that we can't fathom for to get there. And that's sales. Uh, okay, 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 I got you. Because personal development, personal growth, growth mindset, you know, all of that jargonistic terminology mm -hmm. is, a, is a way of selling our self-agency back to us. Mm -hmm. after having been conditioned to believe that we don't have it mm. and we do <laughs> yes. we always have the choice yes and we're told so many times in so many ways that we do not have it and that it's greedy to want to use it mm. and now when they've beaten everyone into a position where they feel helpless right and they've they've tried to reach this dream but don't know how mm -hmm. the idea of help becomes a commodity the idea of answers oh, and solution yeah. Yeah. and secrets. I keep right. seeing that in, in my blooming targeted Instagram ads. I've got a secret. Want to buy it off me? I'm oh, like, you see that a lot, don't you? Gross, gross. <laughs> These three-minute long ads on YouTube going, do you, want the, do you want the woman to chase you? I've got right. a secret. I'm going to talk about it for three minutes as a secret. Yeah. And you've got to, yeah. I'm surprised you're still here. Why haven't you clicked on the link? <laughs> Please. If there was a, oh, it, because it's all sales, because these seven steps to success, four methods to better productivity, mm -hmm. three things to do when you first wake up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they are products. Yes. They are not, they are not acts of service. Right. Right. Someone has created something. And we've been told that numbers matter. And we've been told certain words have more sway with people. And so they just get put into like seven steps or eight methods or something tips or something right. secrets. Yeah. Yeah. And so we go, oh, oh, that's how I reach that dream that I can't reach. I pay for the thing and someone gives me motivation. We can get onto that in a second. So <laughs> <laughs> someone gives me the answer or even the formula. Right. But the problem is they haven't tried and tested this seven steps. They just mm -hmm. created a thing to yep. sell, to mm -hmm. reach a certain echelon, to hopefully reach the dream of right. making their first million or having a certain amount of followers or et cetera, et cetera. 
Yeah, there's not much substance behind that, it sounds like. No. No. no I, well, and just because there isn't substance, it's scary because we're t we are being told that it's the formula. We're being told that it's the way. And so when we buy it and we try it and it doesn't work, right. this codependency, this is, I just had this realization earlier, a couple of hours ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is the most grotesque version of a codependent relationship mm -hmm. where we are told without the words actually being said that we will never be enough without them. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Grotesque, really, really inappropriate, wrong, misguided. Yeah. 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 And, and it's just allowed to happen because mm -hmm. that's just the system. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it all comes to sales too. I mean, all you, sales. You, yeah, you you you've explained it so vividly, you know, um, uh, and and you know there are people who just come up with a method or come up with things uh, and and try to use that as a quote hook, right, to hook people mm -hmm. in um, mm -hmm. via sales without testing anything and without any pro without even providing some uh, some uh, act of service to your point earlier. And that brings me to uh, the great work that you're doing in helping others um, with your coaching and helping people align with their, their true story and everything. I want to talk about some of the awesome work that you're doing, man. I mean, um, from what I understand, you, do, you can do some or you do one-on-one -on -one type of uh, coaching as well as group types of uh, activities and, and workshops as well. Is that right? I do. Yeah. Um, it all started from a workshop. Okay. which came as a result of um, the journey that I've been on mm -hmm. specifically within my relationship to physical stuff. Yes. Um, so I live a, what I call a wanderer lifestyle. Now I nomad's still a word I'm playing with, but mm -hmm. um, this idea of a, a wandering minstrel um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> who, who travels from town to town and collects stories as they go and uh -huh. will provide stories kind of in exchange in a kind of offers and needs market values led trade and exchange um and <laughs> so i'm living this wanderer lifestyle and it means that um or should i say it's a result of having realigned my relationship with stuff okay. and the need that i had for stuff to tell my story for me gotcha Okay. So, so I believe that we are conditioned from birth mm -hmm. um, to create an identity. And I use the word identity and story interchangeably. Gotcha. Um, and by those words, what I mean, because I believe everyone's got a different definition of the same words. Mm -hmm. My definition of that is the person we learned to be, mm -hmm. the things we learned to say, how we learned to behave mm -hmm. in relationships, uh, school, community, in order to retain some control as well as safety and worthiness. Okay. So for me, an example was having learned that being useful mm -hmm. validated me in my family, uh, family dynamic. Mm -hmm. As I grew up and further conditioning happened, I chose to be an actor and that usefulness also grew into the, the desire to be seen as professional and ready. Yes. And so I acquired plays, theatre reference books, you know, things around the industry. And by acquiring and keeping those things, that provided evidence that conditioned me to believe that that identity and story was true and was worth building upon. Okay. So I, so I acquired and kept more books gotcha. and more books and it kept proving and conditioning me to believe that that story was worth yes. uh, building upon. And then it got to a point where I had over 600 books. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, because that stuff just, it just, you know, because if I have more, yeah. more equals better. More right, right. A, a stronger identity, a yeah. less challengeable story. Mm-hmm. But then there was, it must have been one book, like The Straw That Breaks the Camel's Back, that the discomfort of keeping the books was greater than the discomfort of maybe letting them go. Oh, really? Because the cost of stuff, the cost of keeping is energy. Yes, it is. <laughs> Playing around with this, this, have you seen the film The One with Jet Li? <laughs> I sure have. I sure have. The yeah. idea of there is a hundred versions of one person. Yes. And if there one is. person is wiped out, the energy from that person gets split equally That's right. between the rest of the 99 mm-hmm. and it continues down until Jet Li wants to be the only one. Right. I believe that's true with our stuff. Mm-hmm. So I believe if we've got a uh, hundred items and we release one, mm-hmm. that we don't lose the energy that we gave to that thing in the first place. Okay. And by energy, I mean stuff like money, time, logistics of storing it, keeping it, moving it, all those things. Right. And that energy we retain and it gets shared evenly amongst the other 99 items that we have. Right. Which means that each item becomes a new item because it's not just a case of, oh, well, we've got the same amount of energy for each thing. It's just what I knew. In relation to the 100 items, everything becomes different. Yes. So I get to see each item as a new item and it means I get to make a conscious choice as to whether I keep or don't keep that next item that I look at. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I work with people in a workshop environment where I hold that safe space and I introduce them to just what we've talked about. Right. And then I bring them on to what I call the four re's which is, um, we won't get into it right in this moment, but it, it's based on a circular economy system. Okay. And for those who don't know what a circular economy is, it's a process that designs out waste. Okay. A tree is a perfect example of a circular mm-hmm. economy. It doesn't waste anything. Mm-hmm. To me, the waste product in the keep, don't keep kind of quandary that we live in is shame. Mm. Mm -hmm. so this process which is the only one i can find that exists (laughs) without the need for shame right is the four re's where it just gets to be a moment where we practice right and we get to pick up an item Mm -hmm. and we get to give it some factual context Mm -hmm. and there's space for us to feel the feelings we have about that item that's the big difference between that and pretty much everything else that exists out there is that normally we're told we have to push the emotions to one side Mm -hmm. and either get rid or don't get rid. Mm -hmm. I hate those two. I hate that wording, get rid or don't get rid, but that's the way it's packaged. Right. Right. And the idea is that really you should get rid Mm -hmm. because less is more. Right. Even though our conditioning tells us that more is more. Buy the new thing, buy the bigger thing, buy the better thing, have more money, have bigger house, have more, have more kids. Have like more. the books, like right. the books with you, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we are, again, and this is where we come down to being told one thing and the other thing, and we have mm-hmm. to try and navigate this impossible system. Mm-hmm. So if we get the chance to observe any feelings we might have about this fountain pen, which was my dad's, but now he's not with us anymore. So it has emotional connection. Sure. I get to go, oh, okay. Let's turn that into factual context. Right. This pen contains some feelings. And then what I get to do is I get to ask myself the question, do I want or need this now in this moment? And so because I factually contextualized the yes. emotional element, yes. my choice gets to be made in the present. I get to, I, rather than using my, my past and my future of why I kept it in the first place yeah. and why I should continue to keep it, right. I get to go, do I want or need this now? 
And my options are yes, no, or not no yet. Right. Because it's not about having less. The idea is you, you don't get a gold star. I'm not going to rock up and give you a gold star and a no. big old hug for having, <laughs> right. for having less stuff. Yeah. The idea is that if this feels too difficult because of those emotions that we noticed exist within this, right. I get to say not no yet. Understood. And so it goes, it goes into that box, goes into that container, mm -hmm. and I get to pick something else. And I get to practice this circular system. And then gotcha. I get to make a new choice about that thing using the factual context and asking that question. Gotcha. And then eventually I'll come back to the pen. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I've, I don't know, put four things in the yes box, three things in the no box, and a couple of things in the not no yet box. And mm -hmm. I come back to this and it's a different pen. Mm -hmm. Because in relation to all of the other things that I've decide, chosen, I get to go, oh, okay, what's the factual context? I go through the questions again, who, what, when, yeah. where, and why. Yes. I go, oh, I've already put a fountain pen in the yes box. I do need it now. Mm -hmm. So I go, oh, my relationship is different to this. This is slightly broken. So, the, so I notice that the emotional attachment to it maybe feels a little less. Mm -hmm. Maybe feels a bit more uncomfortable to keep it. Yes. So I get to make a new choice. Do I want or need this now? Actually, no, because it's broken. And I've got another fountain pen. So it's all relational. Love it. Love it. Oh, Paul, this is absolutely fascinating, man. Absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about, and I think you really, really touched on it here, is, you know, in working with people, having the workshops that you do, um, I'm sure, you know, when it comes to our story, right, there's our story, you know, and then there's there's some people who have, or maybe all of us, I don't know, have the story we tell ourselves, right? I, I have a feeling that people can often associate with a story that best depicts how they're feeling or why they are the way they are, you know, um, when, when, when in reality, you know, if they just break through that story they tell themselves, they can unleash some incredible potential about what they can achieve. You know, so um, sometimes people have a story they tell themselves to evoke a certain emotional response, you know, um, from those, you know, for the, from those that they share it with. So in your coaching, um, it sounds like what you have just walked us through here with the pen <clears throat> and asking those questions, um, it, does that help you separate the difference in working with the people between realizing their true story and the stories that they've been telling themselves for years? Yeah. Yeah. Because whether you choose to keep something or not is mm -hmm. actually the byproduct of just picking up a, an item and asking right. the question, yeah, who, who, what, when, where, and why, who bought it? Mm -hmm. What is it? <laughs> right. Right. Cause I might think, Oh, it's a pen. But we get yeah. to be really specific. We get to go, oh, it's a fountain pen. Right, and right. By yeah. saying the word fountain pen, I might go, <laughs> oh, I don't actually have any cartridges. So it changes yeah, yeah. my relationship with this pen. Because uh -huh. now energetically, I get to choose whether I go to the shop and get some cartridges specifically to use this pen, yes. which I clearly haven't used for a long time because it's got no <laughs> cartridges. And right. I don't even use a fountain pen. Uh -huh. um, so getting to the point where I, you know, say yes or no to the item is actually kind of irrelevant because we're told that mm -hmm. again we come back to this dichotomy we're, we're told that you should have less but you should buy more right right <laughs> so if that's if that's the broken system we're existing in mm -hmm. clearly something is wrong yes. neither of those things serves us it serves sales right so by people practicing this, and I, and I always get them to start small. So, so it starts with like what I call the just put draw. It's the draw that has all the odds and ends in that you sort of go, right, right. what do I do with this light bulb that I don't know whether it works? So just, just put it in that drawer. Like, just put it, a yeah, I like it. Just put, yeah, I like that, man. That's a good yeah. name for it. There's a couple of bills in there that you're like, oh, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe yeah, yeah. that's a good thing, maybe that's not. Um, <laughs> And I get, I get people to start really low stakes. Low stakes is, mm -hmm. I always come back. 
to mm-hmm. how can you make it as low stakes as possible. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in, 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 in working with people and, and walking them through that, helping them navigate through that, um, I'm sure there's a point where um, you start to talk about the ability to be secure in who we are and to, um, to come into relationship and rediscovering our feminine side if we're a man, if you're working with a man, or our masculine side if you're working with a woman. Um, can, you, can you share with the, with, with the listeners, what, what does that look like? What, first off, what it means. Mm-hmm. And secondly, what does it look like in the work that you do? It feels important to say that I can share what femininity, masculinity means to me. Okay. And with that, just like the short poem, it is an invitation for everyone who's listening Mm -hmm. to explore the words they would use Mm -hmm. in this moment to describe those things. Mm -hmm. Um, So to me... Uh, it's interesting because there's so many different ways of explaining this. So yeah. I, I see femininity and masculinity as an anchor. Okay. The depiction of an anchor. Yeah. And femininity is the, the long, sorry, the wide, sort of shallow mm-hmm. bowl-like shape at the bottom of the anchor. Mm-hmm. And the masculine is the long strut the long piece that attaches the boat to the anchor yes and the reason i explain it as that is because to me femininity is width Mm -hmm. it's absorption it is the thing that connects us to the natural cycle of things okay so the so that's that part of the anchor is what connects us to the ground to the earth right. to the elements and the the straight long piece that is the masculine attaches us to reality okay it attaches us to the boat the the vessel we are using to navigate this world yes yes love it but you cannot have one of those parts separately from the other gotcha they have to be integrated. And this is what terrifies me about the world right now. Because there is a division, a really deep division Mm -hmm. that asks us to pick a side. And we've been told that loyalty is key. Mm -hmm. And because this divide is so so much of a chasm, a constructed chasm. It isn't the natural thing. It's been made that if anyone asks us to be or access more femininity if we're in the masculine camp or to access more masculinity if we're in the feminine camp, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it it feels terrifying. Mm -hmm. It feels miles away. It feels like... Very um, uncomfortable. If we're in... Yeah, and if we're in that, that camp of loyalty... Mm-hmm. then um, it means that we are showing weakness, mm-hmm. which we're told is bad, mm-hmm. to even think about trying. Oh, wow. I see. So, so the, other, the, other, the other part of it is that we're told, well, femininity gets to be with the women and masculinity gets to be with the men. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i'm like why <laughs> yeah yeah i, I are... get it because w- from a word perspective <laughs> yeah yeah man masculine you know femme like the french for woman is fam f-e-m-m-e so yeah. you know femininity you know it's all right. connected to that right right however the world that we see now is a a 
I'm always loath to use the term toxic masculinity because what I actually think, what I actually want to reframe that as is an untapped femininity. Okay. I see. I think the framing is really important because it means yeah. that, that we're challenging men because mm-hmm. we're told that, you know, men are the people who, who exhibit toxic masculinity. And that is mostly true. <laughs> right. But so we, so what we're doing is we're going, you're wrong. Not, mm-hmm. is there anything that's different? Like there's no invitation. Yes. And there's similarly no invitation to women in the feminine camp to access more masculinity mm-hmm. because what we've, because of this separation, what we've done is we've gone, well, masculinity is a manly thing. So we expect women to start walking around with really wide shoulders and a John Wayne walk. And we, ex- <laughs> and we expect men to be ugh, effeminate. Right. But, yeah. but this idea of being girly or soft. Right. I'm like, soft is such... I wrote a blog post about this. So someone asked me to contribute to a blog about what mm. I deem fem- femininity. And femininity to me is curiosity. And masculinity is efficiency. Okay. It takes the information that exists. Right. And it takes everything that's happened before. And it does what I call lumping. Mm, okay. It puts all the data that is similar or the same in one spot. And it works out the average. Okay. And that's its choice of action. Masculinity is about action. Right. And femininity is about curiosity. Mm-hmm. It's about absorption. It's about uh, having a soft front body of yeah. trust. Like femininity is incredibly strong, incredibly mm-hmm. strong. Mm-hmm. It's fierce and it, is, and it is elemental. This idea that to have a soft front body means that you trust whatever happens will not harm you. Right. And that's, that, it, it blows my mind that men who are adopting solely masculinity or, or, or like discarding femininity are missing out on something really powerful and deep. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think people are taking masculinity and femininity at, it, at its face value and not really considering that there, there are multiple layers of each that, 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 truly truly hones in on any person feminine elements feminine layers that uh that 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 a man can relate to and masculine layers that say a woman can relate to are are people not seeing those or considering those those layers and just taking at face value what masculine means is you have a beard you're strong you take action, you don't cry, and then feminine, you're soft, you're dainty, you like right. pink, and that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, well, this is the thing. I think because we have separated the two, yeah. it's impossible to have layers. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So we just see them as two separate identities. Okay. And you have to pick one. Mm. Because the people who float in the middle mm-hmm. or navigate that space in the middle... Right. Because to me, it's not a spectrum. Again, I always come back to something like a, a circular economy, to um, a much more kind of uh, shallow and and wide space yes. Yes. that you that just integrates. The people who float around in the middle are either hippies, <laughs> <laughs> or um, I don't know, like weird there's yeah. a, there's a, there's this idea that they don't know yet that they need to make their mind up they don't know their purpose i guess right well yeah, yeah. i mean that's that's another conversation but yeah yeah for sure yeah <laughs> but yeah that with everything you know the idea of having a right and wrong and mm-hmm. good and bad and mm-hmm. yes and no like that it is very linear. Yes. Masculinity is linear. Mm-hmm. It is ideation. It's, it's idea, action, result. Yes. And it is blinkered. 
And the thing is, this isn't a bad thing. I'm not. Ju- there's no judgment attached to these things. No, no, no. no. This in my exploration. Yes. Is is how I sh- how I see them, and okay. there is a power in actioning something mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in forward motion. Yes. But for but forward motion for forward motion's sake, mm-hmm. to me feels like energy lost or energy expended because we don't necessarily know where we're going. We're just going for the sake of it. I see. The, the cliche is um, men are always waiting for women to get ready to leave, to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's cliche central. Yeah, yeah, it is. Because, because in a man's mind, and I, th- there is conditioning for me that believes that. And so this is, I am by no means providing an answer or going, I, I don't experience any of these feelings. Because that's the, also the really important thing about right. not selling to people is going, I don't have the answers. Right. I just have a way that I'm trying and it seems to be working for me right now. And right. I'm more than happy to share that with people. Yeah. Because yeah. if we can experience less shame in our lives, our lives are going to be so much better. Oh, 100%. Oh. Yeah, 100%. So, so this Paul, idea, yeah, sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just, well, I was going to say, so this idea that, a couple chooses to go out at right. seven o'clock and the man at seven o'clock is sat waiting because in his mind, he's gone, these are the rules mm-hmm. and this is the journey. We've gone choice, action. I get ready for seven and then I get in the car and I leave at seven and I get to the restaurant or wherever we're going at whatever time we get there. Yeah. The feminine energy is not, I'm just going to be late. This is the thing we place femininity in that idea yeah. into the woman and go, oh, well, that clearly means that women don't care. It means that women are just, you know, uh, are disrespectful almost or forgetful mm. at worst. Mm-hmm. Or, mm-hmm. And the thing is, where in the man in that scenario can he tap into the feminine? And, mm. and so the example of that, the question one can ask oneself is, what is true in this moment? Right. And actually that really ticks the masculine male box because what it means is we're looking for the, the facts. We're looking for what's true. And, right. and that observation, outward ex, uh, observation is a very masculine um, action. Mm, I see. So we can go, okay, I'm at home and I'm comfortable. I'm dressed for an evening out. I'm excited for the evening out. It's 7.02. Has the world fallen out from underneath my feet? No. Right. Is someone yeah. going to come rock up at the door and go, I'm, I'm sorry, you said to the world that you were going to go out at 7 and it's 7.02. <laughs> You're a bad person. No. No. <laughs> we get to ask those questions and that is the feminine, is mm-hmm. inviting um, the wider space. The curiosity you mentioned. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I'm going, okay, yeah. what is actually true in this moment? Right. Are we going to be punished by not being able to get into the restaurant if we don't get there by whatever? Right. Did I allow for time for us in case we got stuck in traffic? Like, are we going to be late? Yeah. No. Right. Gotcha. But, but because we lump it into going, well, we said we'd leave at seven. Yeah. Suddenly, all the rules negate the truth mm, okay. or ignore the truth. Yeah. And they go, we said seven and that's my masculine, the rule. That's the right. rule. We're right. going to stick to it because otherwise yeah. it's a bad thing. Otherwise I have no control. Mm. That's the masculine thing. We go, well, wait a second. I said seven, I'm ready. Right. So that's my dominance. That's my I'm doing the man thing. Yep. And now it's two minutes past seven. How do I keep the masculine? We fight, right. we fight to keep the masculine. So that means yeah. we, we demand something. That means we tell someone that they're wrong. Right. Because they are not sticking to the rule that we set. Gotcha. Whereas wow. just a breath into that, just a, br- a breath into the pelvis. <laughs> Some yeah. people say breathe deep. And what I've realized recently is if we breathe wide, yes. if we can breathe into the widest part of our hips, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's our anchor. 
that's our shallow oh the part that comes out yeah. yeah 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 and it gets to sit in there mm-hmm. and we get to go oh okay am i am i at risk am i in danger i got you am i a bad person am i a bad person right ask yourself these questions right am i yeah. failing success uh, and failure is just one of the worst dichotomies created and it is yes. a life that i've lived with this success and failure mm. and i've oh and i've damaged relationships yeah because of it some irretrievably some have taken time to fix mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but this idea of me being right because i stuck to what we said therefore you are wrong is crippling yeah very crippling yeah man and it's dangerous it's dangerous because it means that we place it within the idea of polarization Mm -hmm. going if i'm right therefore you're wrong so there's some judgment about how good a person you are or how much you love me or how much you value this relationship and suddenly the stakes are so high that the the next time you meet in the same room when person comes down the stairs you are in two different places two different places so that conversation that you have is now about attack and defend yeah no it is and and here in the states over the past four and a half five years i've seen such division created as a result of that what i'm doing is right it's opposite of what you're doing so that means what you're doing is wrong this viewpoint I have on these topics, this is where I stand. You have a viewpoint on the same topics. They're the opposite of mine. Mine's right, yours wrong. And then that is just like the breeding ground for other types of um, uh, confrontations, other types of disagreements and disagreements that are unhealthy. There's a, there's a healthy type of disagreement, you know, but but this is to the point to where it's almost radicalized, man. I mean, at least from my observation, again, you know, um, man, I really appreciate you sharing that, Paul. Um, that's, that's some incredible insight when it comes to um, what it really means to rediscover um, your femininity as a man and your masculinity as a woman. So can you share with the listeners how can, how can they connect with you or learn more about the great work you're doing or maybe even participate in a workshop or a one-on-one? Uh, you can head to my website, which is paulsocket.com. Okay. Um, it's very much uh, a playground, not a platform. So I, mm-hmm. I don't really believe in branding. Um, I feel that's restrictive. <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's a space in which I get to put things in, take things out, People get to experience whatever they experience when they go there. And it's kind of like yeah. a choose your own adventure, choose your own Paul adventure, <laughs> um, which is great. And it's really exciting and really freeing. That's another conversation. Um, so they can reach me through my website. I'm on Instagram, um, okay. Soul Pocket. Bit of word play. Pocket. Gotcha. Of um, <laughs> and I'm on Twitter, Paul Socket. And yeah, I think those are my, those are my ways. Oh, fantastic, man. We're going to make sure that we include direct links to your social mediums and your website on the episode show notes. Paul Socket, man, I really appreciate you coming on the show, man. I mean, it's such a great, great conversation. I've learned some insights. I know some things that you've shared has resonated with our listeners. Thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Thanks, Aubrey. It's been an absolute joy and a pleasure. Oh, right on, 100%. So now, man, we're going to go to a segment I love to call Three for the Road. And in Three for the Road, I ask my guests, three random yet thought-provoking questions. And normally I have them try to answer these in five words or less, but I'm going to give you a little more grace because this is going to be a little different. Okay. 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 All right. So um, you, you like words and the use of words and how words can have different meanings to different people, how words uh, can have some context behind them. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, all, my, all my questions are customized for my guests, by the way. There's no cookie cutters. I ask unique questions uh, based off the interests and the, um, and the background of my guests. So yours are customized as well. It's no different. So here's what we're going to do, okay? I'm going to give you three sentences 
okay, one by one. I'm going to give you three sentences, mm -hmm. and the sentence will contain two, each sentence will contain two like words. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I want to see if you can guess what those like words are, and then just share any short thoughts on uh, uh, that, that you have on them, okay? Interesting, yeah. yeah. All right, let's do it. Okay, um, now before I go into it, do you want me to just go into it or do you want me to elaborate a little more on what I mean by like words? I'm all a, I'm a two feet in kind of person. So let's jump in. And then if we, if we suffer some issues, then we can cover it, can't we? Unless yeah, we you sure can. Clear. Yeah, no, we sure can. And, and I think, I think you'll get what these like words are. Okay. Right. All right, here we go. Question number one for three for the road. Here's your first sentence. I will line up when I see the queue moving. Oh, line and cue. There you go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Ding, ding, any, ding. <laughs> any thoughts on them? Line and cue. Um, yeah, well, line to me is very direct. Yeah. Very A to B. Mm -hmm. A cue requires, a cue is often imbibed with um, uh, waiting and anticipation. Gotcha. Uh-huh. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an excitement and a curiosity. Gotcha. gotcha. I, I like a cue because it's it's kind of not about the result because you kind of don't know where you're going to. A degree. Right. You could be yeah. going to a gig or you could be going to the post office uh -huh. and you don't know how the gig's going to go. You don't know who you're going to be stood or sat next to. Yeah, you don't yeah. know who you're going to get at the post office. Yeah, there's, there's something about um, play in there, which I like. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Okay. So, Paul, quest uh, question. Question. Sentence number two, all right? John went to use the toilet. John and toilet. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> that was a bit of a sneaky one because we don't really use the word John in the UK. <laughs> no. um, but yeah, thank, thank goodness for American television. Um, <laughs> yeah, John and toilet. Uh, yeah. I don't really have any thoughts on that. Oh, actually, there's a really interesting one, very quickly, that yeah. I believe that the nervous system could be much more restful going to the toilet is actually an opportunity for men specifically mm -hmm. to calm their nervous system if they sit down when they go to wee at the toilet mm, gotcha there's an idea of like i'm, I'm just thinking imagine like man back in the day of yeah. like in the wild having to stand to urinate but being very ready yeah yeah the alertness that comes with standing up <laughs> yeah yeah they can they can kind of release some guard maybe when they right. sit down right yeah. It suggests that at least. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Sentence number three, Paul, to uh, top off three for the road. Here we go. Michael called me and asked if I can phone him later. Called and phone? There you go. That's right. Yes. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. Let's see. I kind of threw that one in because, um, well, uh, kind of related, kind of not. I, I, I spent a lot of time in Canada um, for business and, um, and, and, and I thought I've heard this in British television. Um, but, you know, instead of saying, I'll, um, give so-and-so a call, I've heard people say, um, why don't you phone them? You know? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 I, and coming from the States, I'm used to saying call. And so mm -hmm. I just kind of threw that in for that. So yeah. I always found that was an interesting association, you know, I mean, uh, and, 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 you know, I've, I've had, I've had Canadians kind of pick on me from some, for some of the words and slang that we use. And then, mm -hmm. then I would say something like, well, what about phone? You know, phone is an object. It's not a verb. You call someone, am I going to car down the street? You know, right. so, <laughs> you know, and, and so I would say those types of things. So anyhow, it was just all in good natured ribbing, nothing, nothing yeah, beyond no, that. Fine. So but yeah. I, actually just made me realize that call because you mentioned call and response earlier yeah. there's a very kind of give and take element to calling someone normally yeah. it's getting someone's attention yes rather than necessarily passing something on or i don't know there's, there's something very interesting energetically about that idea of call someone ways sort of yeah anyway interesting yeah. yeah yeah outward focus for sure oh beautiful all right paul socket 
Thank you again, man. Great conversation. And please, let's stay in touch, okay? Um, six to eight months later, you know, you have something uh, coming on, uh, going, you know, a project you're working on or, or something you'd love to share um, with, with, with the listeners, maybe an update on what's going on in your life. Uh, I'd love to have you back on the show, man. Yeah, it'd be great. Can't wait. Six to eight months is so much is going to happen in that time. I know oh, it. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, there's a lot of great activity going on, especially in the great work that you're doing I have no doubt at all. So once again, Paul, thanks for coming on to the show. Thanks, and I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review this show. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Lipson, or wherever you listen to your shows. All right. But more importantly, if you know someone or there's a loved one in your life who is really going through a rough patch, really struggling, going through dark days, nothing but despair, maybe even depression, and they seem to be at the end of their rope. Please, I ask you, please share this show with them and let them know two things. And this is what this show is about, two things. Number one, there's always hope, always. And number two, you are not alone. You're not alone. Thank you so much. The Road to Rediscovery, it's a movement, a revolution. And guess what? You are now part of it. Thanks so much for riding this road with me. It's been an incredible journey, and let's keep things going. Until next time, we'll chat again soon. The Road to Rediscovery is an AJ Shark production.